All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for waiting uh, maybe a minute over time while Michael and I were just catching up. Uh, but I am very excited to introduce Brex to our audience uh, live for the first time. Now, many of you might have known Brex already. If you're a Gus Launch customer, you've seen the integrated Brex workflow you have on your dashboard. Uh, you might have seen some of our mentioning of it in our marketing materials. But now we're bringing them at the right moment for our education and programming all around cash flow for startups. So this is part of our grow theme for Q2, where we're focusing on everything kind of post-launch of a startup's life cycle and what is all the things that you need to get in place to actually grow your business, to get into that traction state. When if later, whether you know, a seed round or something is big in your future, uh, how to get your house in order. And while we can help you out, you know, in terms of all the corporate back office basics and boilerplate press practices through Gus system, Brex is our financial banking solutions partner um, who are experts at this kind of cash management stuff. So we thought we'd bring them in um, and I'm pleased to introduce Michael Tannenbaum from Brex. He's their COO. He's going to walk us through a presentation. Yes, we record it. We will share this out uh, a couple of days after the event once we clean it up and any relevant materials and whatnot. The chat in the Q&A is open, so please feel free to ask questions. Use the q and &A, I'll mark them. Uh, mostly we'll take care of them at the end, but if there's anything super relevant or contextual, I might surface this up uh, live during Michael's presentation. And without further ado, take it away, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. And just want to thank everybody for joining today. Um, I have been at Brex for almost six years, uh, which is a really long time for Brex. I was the first employee. I've scaled with two different startups, uh, Brex and SoFi. And so I am. I love doing this presentation and I love to connect with startups and, and help them with their finances. It's something that I think I know a lot about. I'm happy to share what I've learned over uh, the two startups that I've worked at. So really happy to be here and uh, appreciate the partnership with Gus, um, of course. So thank you, Ryan, for having me. Um, so just what I'm going to talk about today, I, uh, whoops, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to talk about first, Brex, and um, a little bit about us, a uh, quick commercial. Um, as Ryan mentioned, um, we are a corporate card and expense management company. So think of us as like both Amex and Concur. Uh, we got our start in startups and we offered a corporate card for startups. And then we built a bunch of expense management on top of that. Um, really helpful to the community. You probably saw us do a bunch of things around the SVB um, issues. And we also offer um, a banking account like product that uh, called Brex Cash. So um, a lot of investors and, and growth, um, which has been really exciting. And so feel free to check us out. Um, and now I'm going to move on to startup financial advice. And so one thing that I think that I really like to emphasize here, and you'll hear me talk a lot about today, is that startups are unique, right? There's small companies that want to be big, and there's not very there's nothing else that's like that, right? So there's big companies and there's small companies, you know, there's bakeries and there's IBM. And there's obviously everything in between, but there's very few big things that are the size of a bakery that want to be like IBM soon. And that makes startups very unique. And so the way that you should be thinking about your financials as a startup is that it matters a little bit more because you want to be big. And so because of that, there's a bunch of uh, recommendations that I have, and I won't go through all of them on this page, but the lens that I'm using here is the fact that you want to be big. And so from a personnel perspective, the finance that you create, the, the systems, all of that, you want that to be uh, built for scale. Same with the software, right? So you want to use tools and people that have a strong financial sense and that are going to scale with you. So sometimes there's an operational founder or outsourced accountant that you can get, but you definitely need to have somebody that feels responsible for the finances and for them being broadly right at the company, because again, we're building this for scale. You want to use uh, a good accounting software. You want to use a bank that understands the startup. I probably should update this, um, although SVB is sort of still an option, but I didn't think about that. <laughs> I was um, also going to say Gust and Gust Launch should be on that second Yeah, no, too. sure. So let me, I'll modify that at the end. It should be on that. Um, so that's a, a miss on my part. Um, same with a payroll um, all basically all of the uh, tools that you use, there are just certain tools for almost everything that you're going to see where they focus on startups. And because startups are unique, again, because they are small, but want to be big, you want to work with a vendor that understands that for all of these things. In terms of approvals, um, you know, just getting into some basics here. I think you all money outside the, the, the company, you always want that tracked. 
Um, you saw this become much more important with SVB. Uh, I'm going to go into th more detail into all this, um, but a couple of different processes that I recommend, um, of course, depends on how big of a company you are. But one thing you definitely, that at a minimum, even at the smallest stage for Brex that I found valuable, make sure you are have some kind of budget at the founder level. It does I don't mean hold every employee to a budget, but some sort of sense of how you think expenses are going to happen. Uh, come out and then how they actually turn out because the delta between what you expect and what actually happened is very valuable and you'll learn a lot about your company and the way you're spending money and what you're doing if you do that process. Um, so that's kind of my overview here. Um, I think there's just from a financial perspective in terms of like monitoring spend, like I said, I would go more into detail here, talked about budgeting and forecasting, at a very basic level, just think about how much money your company is going to spend over the month. And then at the end of the month, rack that up versus what happened versus expectations. And you want to be doing that because even a co-founder, right? There's just this concept, and you'll hear me talk about this today, is this, this idea of checks and balances. It doesn't just apply to the government and the way the U.S. government set up. It also applies to financial services, right? These concepts of controls, audits, they don't need to be so overbearing but you just want to have some checks on the system. So you want to check in with your co-founder on what money's been spent, right? That's a good process to have. Um, in general, when you're thinking about budgeting and planning and cash burn, which is, you know, we'll get more into that. But another thing you'll hear me talk a lot about is this six-month runway. So in general, six months for early stage startups is the number of runway that I think you kind of need to stay sane keep employees not super concerned, but also be realistic, especially in a market like this, where fundraising is hap it, it, you know, is more difficult. Buffers are always good, but in general, six months is kind of what you're working with because that's how much time realistically you're going to need to execute a fundraise process. So you can't budget and fundraise based on when you actually run out of money because once you run out of money, you run out of money. So you can't fundraise after that. Um, did you want to ask a quick question yeah, there? Sure, sure, sure. So sure. is that six months of like, is that like thinking of your runway as an emergency fund, like six months of operations in the bank, or is that revenue plus bank balance should get you to six months of life before you, you know, have the signal of starting a fundraise? Yeah, the latter. So it's six months of burn and yeah. we'll get into how you sort of budget burn and calculate that. Um, but a little bit more detail on what I mentioned in terms of personnel, um, so somebody must maintain accurate books and records. It doesn't mean you need a CFO. It doesn't mean you need a, um, VP of finance even. It just means that somebody feels accountable, right? Accountability is a huge thing in startups. So someone feels accountable for the books and records. Like this person is like, I believe that these are right. The problem that I see a lot with early stage companies, everyone's like, oh yeah, we don't care about this. And I don't think everyone needs to care about it, but but someone does, right? That That's the point. And so even if you outsource it, right, which is common in early stage and is my recommendation, I actually don't recommend hiring a CFO or a VP of finance for most companies because at the end of the day, and I had to learn this the hard way as a up and coming VP of finance at a series I think this was when SoFi was like series C or D. I remember the founder said to me, he was like, look, like finances doesn't matter that much here, right? Like, and I think that's the point is like your company's going to be successful or not, regardless of finance at the earliest stages. That's very rarely, although I'll get into when, really rarely is it super important. And so you, you need it, right? You want, you're building for scale. Like I've been saying, you want it to be right. You don't want to inherit a mess that then prevents you from scaling in the future, prevents you from getting audited, prevents you from going public, prevents you from getting fundraising because the more and more rounds that you raise, the more sophisticated the financials that investors expect, right? So you don't want to be creating a problem, but you don't need a CFO. And so typically you would outsource this, right? To an outsourced accountant, or um, I'm sure Gust has recommendations of outside people you can work with, perhaps um, so does Brex. And so there's a lot of options, but still someone internally needs to feel accountable for their work. Right. Just like with anything, if you're going to outsource PR, you're going to outsource whatever. There's still somebody who says, I care about the output of what that person doing. Right. And then in the around, I, I tend to recommend that you hire a CFO ish type person or VP of finance around series B. Um, of course, it, it could de depend on the company. There's always reasons. I was the first employee at Brex. Right. So, but I did a lot of things that weren't 
the, the CFO piece of what I did, even though I used that title, was pretty small. I was doing sales, customer support, financial partnerships, capital markets, all these things. And also because Brex is a fintech company, which means that the, the financial money movement inside of Brex is much more significant than it's going to be inside a SaaS company. And so I think for a lot of fintech companies, they do bring on a finance person earlier. And so that does, that does make sense. It's almost um, like they, they have a bit of a product role in there because the yeah. nature of the product is financial, where if you're building an app that is completely divorced from it, like you need somebody to do your books to be sure you, that runway you trust uh, to be sure that you you know pay the appropriate tax or do the appropriate thing and don't have an unclear vision of when you're going to go out of business, but you don't necessarily need strategic financial level advice. Exactly. Exactly. So now let's get into more the basics of what finance actually looks like at startups. So in general, we're talking about burn, right? That and cash. So cash is king. You probably heard people say that. I can tell you a funny story. I remember at SoFi when we were trying to figure out how much cash we had and there was like some report and it was didn't make a lot of sense. I remember the CFO was like, just give me the bank statement. I just want to know what's in the bank, right? So it's like cash is kind of what is, is king. And so um, in general, you should have a clear sense of how much cash you have and how much cash has changed over time. How it changes over time is your burn, usually talked about in month, right? So how much over the last month did you burn? Divide cash by that number, that's your runway. Those are like the most basic concepts of startup finance. And so what's interesting though, because when you start getting into accounting, right, is that you will not find cash burn on any, on either of the, primary financial statements, right? The income statement or the balance sheet are the two most popular GAAP, US GAAP financial statements or international IFRS, right? That's when you think about like accounting and, and what people talk about, they're talking about the income statement or the balance sheet. Neither of those is cash. Cash is the interaction between those two. And so that is confusing and I don't really need to get into that. But the point is, is that make sure because we're getting back to like primal needs hierarchy of a cfo right hierarchy of financial needs number one is cash like cash and runway that's the number one thing you need to solve for and so at a minimum just look at how much your bank account moved over the past uh month right of course there's nuances of payroll and when it goes out and all these other things that a good finance or accounting person will help you work with but at a minimum you're talking about just the change in cash um there are certain nuances, like I said, I made a prepaid example or a postpaid example. So you may run payroll, right? Payroll happens typically two times a month. And so depending on where the month ends, you may, if you don't prorate it appropriately as compensation gets a bigger expense, you can miss that. And that's a pretty big adjustment to cash that, that I would make. Um, subscription models, right? Remember if you're getting money upfront in advance, um, like you're charging upfront, you're probably obtaining a lot more cash, say like even an airline, right? You're paying for things upfront for them. Airbnb is another thing that works like that. So certain subscription models are prepaid. Cash can be more divorced from how the company's working. Be aware if your company is like that, obviously, because that, that could be meaningful. But most companies, standard software company, standard app, as Ryan mentioned, standard fintech company, you know, it's all happening in month. Not, not much to worry about there. Um, I just put some helpful benchmarks from Brex data about, you know, how much these early stage companies burn uh, by geography, um, which is hopefully helpful. Is that um, monthly we, or quarterly? Uh, that's Here. monthly. Monthly, um, yeah, and, you, and you could, um, we have a bunch more of this kind of data uh, on our blog, which is interesting. Um, we do a lot of data journalism. So determining if um, you need to fundraise. So this get this gets into a, probably the second biggest topic after cash runway and burn, which is fundraising. And so the what I sort of um, not sort of what I recommend is that you approach a milestone based fundraising process. So you fundraise based on operational and financial milestones. So and they interact, right? And so basically. Normally, when you when you think about fundraising, you're fundraising for a reason, right? You're fundraising because you want to grow. You're fundraising because you've hit some operational milestone on the business. And the art of fundraising, actually the art and science of fundraising, is that you want to make those needs match your runway and burn. 
And so you want to make sure that when you think that you have the operational metrics to raise money, you're going to have sufficient runway to get to those metrics so you can fundraise. So you're sort of thinking in the future, like as an example, you know, once we do our beta and get 100 customers, we think that's going to be a big proof point that this work working. Or once we sign these partners and show that we can get 10% of our funnel be organic referral, then we're going to really, you know, hit it out of the park for the Series A, what, whatever it is, right? So you think about what those milestones and objectives are, and then you sort of back into that plan of how long it's going to take you to get there and what you need. And that's sort of the way you put together your milestone-based fundraising. And it's very important that you get agreement among that with your leadership team, whether that's just you and a co-founder, maybe just you, maybe other people, like that piece is very, that alignment is very important because if you're working towards something and you're not sharing that with other people that are in the company building, that's gonna, that's going to um, cause issues. And so the way you do this, like I was saying, is you forecast the business, right? You think about how your cash, like what are your cash needs going to be over the next couple um, months or years versus to get to this milestone and how will it all work? And so a couple of ways you do this, you set your KPIs and your clear North Star metrics, right? And I think you'll hear me talk more about this, but one of the best things to do and one of the things I don't see founders do enough is to think about what companies already exist that are similar to your company. And, I, and it's not a natural thing for a founder to do, but it's a very natural thing for a finance person to do because you know, in finance, you're taught benchmarking, right? You are always looking at how public companies, and it's only because public companies share this kind of data in their reports, right? Their SEC filings. You can look at how other companies have done, right? And so you want to think about what are the relevant KPIs for your customer and for your company. And so as an example, right, if you are doing B2B SaaS for SMBs, you should look at HubSpot right, as a public company or Zendesk, right, and how they, what their churn is or how many customers they add in a month and how has that changed for the years that they've provided information since they went public, right? And if you are doing a subscription, you, and it's consumer, you should know what the retention is like at Netflix because that could be considered best in breed or what is, you know, all of these sort of metrics are helpful for benchmarking, but also you need to be identifying what is the number one or number two thing, two or three things in your company that like, it's usually not revenue, but it's a building block to revenue. And I shared some here of like, what do these companies think are their North Star metrics? And usually they are not revenue, almost in this case, none of them is, but they are highly correlated to revenue, right? Airbnb, they're focused on number of nights booked. Obviously that leads to revenue, but they would say if there's an issue around nights booked, it's going to show up in the future as revenue and revenue in that example, right? It could be that more affluent people continue to sign up for Airbnb and are booking more expensive nights, but actually the number of nights are going down and they probably want to know that. So they focus on nights booked, not just revenue. That's just an example. Okay. So KPIs for startups. So a um, couple of things that you need to know, these are next level down from the top line, right? So at the top line, we talked about com some common ones are user metrics. Um, so churn, retention, growth, uh, cross-sell, funnel. Um, so these are all kind of like secondary KPIs. If you we were going with the number of nights booked example, these are all things that are going to be related to that top line North Star metric. Um, a lot of people focus on, you know, the conversion metrics around the funnel um, for the website or for the app. So those are definitely um, places that I've always focused. And in an early stage company, I have always actually had a specific funnel meeting that I personally ran like at Brex and at SoFi, where we would look at all of the conversion stages of the funnel every week and sort of look at what was happening and, and what we could do to fix it. Um, so that's a good I recommend that approach. Um, profitability metrics start to matter later, um, but now profitability is quite in vogue, as you're all aware. So they matter more now. Um, I don't think people are looking for profitability at the early stage. The whole nature of startups and of the venture-backed world is that 
these companies, you know, profit, there, there's people willing to fund lack of profitability because they believe in, in future profitability. So that that's still core to the market. Um, but a lot of these metrics that I put here, these are metrics that indicate future profitability, right? So marketing payback is like how much, how quickly are you getting paid back on the marketing spend? Almost by its nature, you're not profitable from that metric because you're not getting paid back right away, right? You're investing in marketing and it's taking time to get paid back. Um, customer acquisition cost is related to that. Gross profit, which is sort of the unit profitability when you deliver, you know, one unit of your good. So say one month of software or one student loan for SoFi or one Airbnb night, whatever it is, um, you know, how much are you making per customer? And obviously, so one of the things that people like a lot about software is the unit costs for delivering software are very low, right? Once you write the code and sell it, there's not much uh, marginal cost to that. And then I think headcount is such is the biggest driver of cost for almost all companies in the space. And so there's a lot of uh, focus on headcount, especially right now. Um, and so people are focused on th those sort of headcount metrics and investors will be asking about that. So revenue per head, how much people make on average, anything to do with customer support is often tied to headcount. Those are all uh, KPIs that people focus on. Um, so now I'm going to move on to actually building the projections. Remember, we're doing that milestone-based fundraising. And so as a result, we um, want to be thinking through wh what are the milestones in the future and then how much money do we need to hit those milestones? So we'll talk about how you do that. So it's a bit counterintuitive, but the actually the easiest things to forecast for startups are expenses, right? Because those are going to be what you know, right? You, you generally know how many people you're going to have and how many people you need. You know how much you're spending on legal. You know what you're, if you have an office, you know what it costs. You have a good sense for marketing. That's the harder one. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit. But, and that, that can be a big one. But in general, like if you're already operating, you know who your people are, you know how much they make, you know what the contractors cost. And so it's pretty simple exercise to actually plan in the future, you know, what, what these things are going to cost. Um, it's the product expenses that are a little more difficult, right? And so with product, hopefully comes revenue, but not always, right? Um, but in general, uh, so you kind of need to understand your revenue drivers. And here I, I recommend you think about gross versus net. A lot of examples of gross versus net, but discounts or coupons is probably the easiest one. So you're only getting net. So if you are offering something, let's say you're selling skincare line, you're offering it at $100, but you're, you know, 60% of the people get a coupon, right? And that coupon is for 50%, right? You got to think about what the actual net price that you're receiving is. So, I mean, it seems obvious, but just helpful to, to say. And then you also want to look at your other associated COGS. I talked a little bit about gross profit, but those are all the costs to deliver the good. In software, there's very few, right? Maybe a little bit of customer support. Of course, web hosting, if you're, if you're delivering SaaS uh, over the internet, then you have some AWS costs to actually uh, host that. But in general, with software, there's not a lot of associated costs uh, that are direct. I think with something like Brex, right? For us, we deliver a card and... Then there's the rewards that come with it. There's the part of the money that we have to pay to Visa and MasterCard. Anything that's coming one for one that comes with every unit of product that you sell. So Airbnb, the amount that they pay out to the host, right? That would actually be net net revenue there. But any other cost that they have, um, uh, and then you build the model, right? So you have your non-product expenses, your product expenses, and you forecast this out in Excel, in Google Sheets. Brex has a product called Pry that's really good for this. And you keep it simple. You focus on the five to 10 key assumptions. You know, how many people do you have? How much product are you selling? What are the costs associated with that? And you sort of build out what it's going to cost and, you know, what are your financial projections in the future? Um, at some point, you are going to need to make there's like this chicken or the egg with marketing and product that comes up, right? And so uh, let me come back to that. Um, but there's this issue that you have where you are need to determine how many will we sell next month? And there's two ways you can do it. You can say, well, we're going to sell this much 
and therefore we know that it's going to cost us X dollars to sell, like to get in that many customers, but we think we're going to get a hundred customers. Or you can say, we're going to spend this much on marketing and that's going to bring in this many customers. And either way you have, you have to do one or the other. There's, there's no way around it. So you either are saying, I'm going to lead with a marketing budget and then I'm going to determine a ROI on that marketing budget, or I'm going to lead with a forecast and look at how much I think it's going to cost to bring those people in. And I think it really just depends on the way that your product works. I think if you're, of course, somebody that's running like a lot of Facebook ads, trying to de generate demand for your product, you're probably going to do the former. If you're more organic and you're more referral word of mouth, you would probably lead with like how many people are going to come next month based on the history of last month. And then like, what do I think it's going to cost for the others to come in? Um, so I see a question. So I do, wanted to stop there, Ryan. Uh, I think you'll cover it in uh, the okay. next slide that I, I previewed. <laughs> okay. And so one thing that I do want to talk about um, that is really helpful for all this is a Brex product pry. Um, I've used it myself. I think it's definitely helpful to do a lot of the core financial planning things that I talked about, financial planning, hiring and headcount planning. Again, this is a tool more for startups, right? So this is not like there's a bunch of mid-market tools out there that do a lot of fp &A and 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 fp &A stands for financial planning and analysis or hiring plans, but this is more of a basic tool that you would use as a startup um, where I think, honestly, because I was talking about something uh, like the balance sheet and the income statement, because your standard accounting reports don't do the most critical things, right? They don't provide cash flow and they don't really forecast headcount, which is the biggest expense. Um, this is a, a helpful tool that, that Brex offers. Um, so I would check it out. Cool. Mm. So- and You've the question is, your is that included what with Brex or is that a separate um, tool and service? It is a separate tool and service. You don't have to use Brex to use it. Um, and I think if you sign up for Brex, you get a version of it free or lower price. So <laughs> um, as you would expect, Ryan. So yeah, setting valuation, always a um, an important topic. And it just gets back to this milestone fundraising. So You've at your milestones and you've modeled those out, just reminding you, you figured out the, through financial modeling that we talked about, what are the resources you need to attain that milestone? You've given yourself that cash burn six month buff buffer. So you arrive at your, your, your value, you arrive at your fundraise. And in general, you know, for a earlier stage round, the investor is wanting to own 20-ish percent of the company, right? That could flex to 15, maybe, right? And there's different rules, but in general, the way that the valuation comes together, in my experience, is that you have an amount of money that you need to, remember, you're always thinking everything's milestone-based. So until you're profitable and don't need outside money, you're always thinking like, well, what's the next milestone, right? I hit this milestone, I'm going to fundraise, but I'm fundraising to hit my next milestone. So what do I need for that? So you have a sense for how much dollars that requires. And as a result, you have a sense for how much you need to raise. And if you know how much you need to raise, you kind of know what expectation, expected ownership these new investors will want, right? So if you need 5 million, right, then you know that, well, people investing 5 million are going to want to own 20% of the company. So you're talking about a 20, $25 million valuation, and that intuitively checks out with where you see series A's, you know, it used to be seeds, but maybe A's happening, right? And so of course there's pre-money versus post and there's nuances of, of the options pool and all these things are, you know, are nuances, but ballpark, that's generally what is happening. And so more capital intensive companies or companies that need to raise more money Sometimes, you know, in, in more bullish markets, that's why you were seeing like bigger, these companies raise even more money because they, you know, someone doesn't want to do the work as an investor. They don't really want to do the work of being on the board and underwriting the company and all this to not own 15, 20% of the company. So that's a big reason why that's, that happens. But of course, 
it's not happening in isolation. So the other market comparables and an insanity check makes sense. So that's where I go back to the um, benchmarks that I talked about before, which is to say that if you are, investors are going to look very high level, right? They're not expecting that your financials are going to mirror a public company. But if you're selling B2B software, they might say, well, you know, what is the metrics look like for Atlassian? Or what do the metrics look like for, you know, some public company in your space? How did, you know, how quickly did they grow market share? Or how many customers, how long did it take them to get to a thousand customers? And if you're saying you're going to do it in 10% of the time, is your financial plan reasonable? Or by the way, every company that looks like you that's trading in the public markets is terrible and nobody will touch. You're probably going to have to, like that 20% rule might not apply for you. Right. So I think those are all the type of, of reality checks that's really helpful to do that financial benchmarking and just understand whether it's the industry or customer or business model or what about what you're doing is similar in a public company. There's always something that's benchmarked. Right. It may just be that you're a subscription model, totally different market, but you're looking at Peloton. Right. Just that that's the way you need to be thinking. So a little bit on the process um, and, and what you want to do is you want to manage, oh, sorry, before I get into this, I saw a question. Oh yeah, I was typing on an answer, but <clears throat> on answer live, uh, Nicole's asking the difference between Brex and Forecaster. So full disclosure, Forecaster is one of Gus's partners. They do financial modeling. I assume it's very similar to Pry in a in kind of a box. But in my experience, Brex has, it's a banking solution, you know, partnering with multiple banks. It's a charge card. It's financial management tools, expense management, travel, all the stuff wrapped around, what do you call it? Like Amex and Concur stuck together? Yeah. 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 And I think Pry was an acquisition of yours, right? That's right. Yeah. I think there's, there's, um, I think, uh, yeah, I can't speak to that, but, you know, check them out and I'm, I'm sure there's differences. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the, the main thing that I've seen with Pry that is helpful is the headcount planning and forecasting. Yep. Um, so how do you manage investor expectations while you're doing this? So you want to set your process, right? This is a key thing. Um, of course, one of the big challenges that we have in this market today is that this fear of missing out, FOMO, that used to exist in fundraising is a little bit gone, right? There used to be this sense that um, you know investors felt like they were missing out and so they would kind of pour in and now the market is softer. And so the way, so one of the ways to get around that is to really manage the process tightly and set the expectations, right? If people are expressing interest, you say, okay, well, I'm collecting term sheets at this point in the future and planning on closing at that point. So people understand that, you know, there is a process happening. So you want to set expectations. You want to have your core outputs um, ready to go, right? So you have a presentation, you have some form of investor model. Remember, we got to this place by forecasting cash flow. So we have a sense for this and you clean that up for investor ready. And then you have the supporting schedules to that model. One of the biggest ones is unit economics, right? And so investors don't look for profitability typically at the early stage, but they do look for positive unit economics, right? Meaning they look that look to see that with at the marginal sale, like the next sale that you make, that you're making money on just that sale. There may be a lot of overhead. You may have to spend money on marketing. You may have to spend money on all these other things, but you're not giving away your product at a loss. That's very important to people. Next thing is the market model. And this is goes back to the benchmarking that I talked about. And so the market model is like, how big is your market and what market share are you suggesting you take over time? And that is very, and, and the best way to look at that is, is through comparables, right? And so for Brex, if we were saying, well, we're going to get to this amount of payment volume, let's say a billion a month, it's relevant to know how big Amex is, right? Because if Amex is only 5 billion a month, and we're saying we're going to do 1 billion a month in the first three years, and Amex is a 100-year-old company, I think investors are going to ask, well, why, right? That's pretty big to get 20% of their market in four years. So I think that's, you want to be thinking about like what the market, how big it is and how much market share is reasonable for you to get and how much of time and how, if there are other new entrants, how much did they get in that time too? And I think even though you're not necessarily projecting future profitability, having a sense of that outside perspective is going to be really valuable. 
So how do you wow investors, which is a goal? Um, obviously, fast growth and adoption, that, that's always true. I think um, what I've seen work is having a, a very personal and deep understanding of the pain points and connecting with that. Um, and so I think a lot of times, at least both companies that I've worked at, uh, whether it be uh, SoFi, where it was a lot about you know the student loan crisis and how that was affecting graduates and 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 um, the ramifications of that, or Brex, where we had two founders from Brazil who weren't able to get uh, credit cards when they were trying to start a different business and had built a payments business in Brazil. You know, some sort of deep connection, not making it seem like you just were doing research on how to build a big company that tends to not be as attractive. Of course, you know, whatever truth always sets you free. So if that's the truth, that's the truth. Um, but I think lean into, lean into the origin story. Um, and then I think pricing power and lack of price sensitivity are something that people don't necessarily think about, but in this market are probably more important, right? And so is there a sense that over time you can either charge for this, you can raise price for this? Is this a commodity? All sort of the standard like Porter's Five Forces business school type approach to things. Um, people are going to be looking for that even in the early stage. And, and that's where unit economics comes in, right? People want to see that there's some pricing power and some ability to charge for what you have. So I can take some of the questions uh, that have already been been written and then happy to take other ones live. Yeah, yeah, we got some good ones in here. Um, going back to that uh, concept of runway and milestone based, um, what are your thoughts on estimating this is Elias uh, based on multiple milestones in a longer time frame, like a year, rather than doing two rounds of six month runway approach? Yeah, so I am not recommending doing everything in six month increments. What I am saying is that whatever you do, make sure there's a six month buffer. So a standard company at like a seed, you know, raises a pre seed round, Y Combinator, or something, you know, works with Gus, gets a little bit of money, whatever, right? You get 100,000, that kind of range. There, you're trying to build a prototype and you're not spending very much money. And so you want to be thinking like, okay, maybe it's not even six months at that point because it's just usually you and a co-founder and or a couple co-founders and everybody there can sort of handle it, right? They knew that coming in, but it's as you start to get employees, that's where when you stop having six months and people can feel that they start to get nervous. So what I'm suggesting is you want to plan your company's financials around the burn and around fundraising milestones. And when you do that, give six months of buffer between right. those ones. So that means that if you decide to raise funds, you have at least six months of money either in the bank or incoming, depending on your business model. Right. If you're doing gap menu subscription based and you know your churn numbers, you know, you could sure. be a little bit more generous with your bank balance. But just knowing that you nobody can raise funds in an emergency uh, because the emergency nature of raising funds is going to be the biggest red flag in the world for investors. You know, if the case is like, I need this money or I go out of business next week, it's like, oh, well, that's not that attractive, right? It yeah. sort of suggests you might not know what you're doing, even if you do. And so that's where, um, yes, exactly. And look, I, this is ideal, right? Of course, I'm not going to tell you that in my entire experience, I've never seen people go inside of six months, of course, right? I've been, we can do war stories for another day, but I've seen a lot of different things. Um, and so if I, you know, that was a company where we were, the student loans were capital intensive, right? We were refinancing people's student loans and then getting money from loan buyers on the back end. So it was very like liquidity and cash management was very, very topical there. And there were absolutely times where we didn't have six months. And I will say, cause there's a related question I see a lot. Um, and why, like, you know, everybody would like to have three years of runway in the bank, you know, but more often than not, you're probably reinvesting that in your business. Uh, but the one thing to consider doing funding rounds not too far up front is how much of your company you're giving away. And kind of what you said with the fundraising thing is work backwards from what you're going to use the funds for and only raise as much as you need to get to the next milestones. Because if you're raising more than that in an earlier round, chances are you're giving away more of your company when if you made traction. So if you raised enough to get another year and a half, and in that year and a half, you built stuff and you had revenue and you had partnerships and you're just, you can up your valuation when you raise money again, you give away less of your company. Yeah, I'd rather take two, uh, a 500,000 and a million dollar installment spread out over the course of two years with different terms than $1.5 million in a seed round 
if I didn't, if I was just going to sit on two thirds of it and not use it, but I gave up, you know, 20% of my company to do so. Yeah, exactly. All right, Kenneth, uh, he's got, what about percentages for smaller and earlier raises? Um, are angel investors looking for those large percents because they're much earlier? Typically, no. Um, angel investors are usually looking, at least myself, who's an angel investor, normally they're looking to be helpful, right? So angel investors, by their nature, not just because they have a little halo over their head, but their <laughs> nature is generally to be helpful. And they're like, passionate about in, about helping the companies versus motivated by financial return, typically. Like they want to make money. They want to be compensated for their time and efforts. But the nature of an angel investor is generally a little bit different. And so that first round, whether it be angels, friends and family, founder funded or accelerator, right? That first round is to sort of like get a concept off the ground. And their um, people are not necessarily looking for a percentage, but in that, and that's why many people use what is known as a safe, um, which is basically just an agreement for a future fundraise and future metrics, because typically at that early of a round, you're not dealing with these types of things. And you're just saying, will this get off the ground and get to a fundraise where I could then participate at, at market terms? And so that's how a lot of those work. Yeah. And individual angels, they're usually not writing checks that are so big that they could say, I want 10% of your company. They're $25,000, $50,000 checks. Altogether, an angel round might still sell off 10% of your company eventually when you do a preferred round and the convertible notes or the safes convert. Um, and angels that play longer term games will often you know, ratchet up to the next round to be a preferred shareholder. And now they care more about the returns because the company's going. But in the earlier stages, it's a it can be a little more loose. But do you pay attention to your valuation caps on your convertible instruments? They will determine the eventual amount of your company you will sell away for however much you raise. So it's still worth doing the math. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, we got Crispin. Is location still relevant? Um, do I have to be within a quick drive to Menlo Park, NYC, or Silicon Beach? Ooh, Silicon Beach. Or does is Silicon Beach, teams? Miami? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I haven't heard that one before. Um, oh, no. I think it's LA, actually. LA? I think so. Or a remote team based anywhere and everywhere stand a chance of getting funding? Yeah, I mean, look, Brex is a remote company. Our founders were from Brazil. And so they did do YC, but they were not connected in any way to Silicon Valley. Um, and I think we definitely, um, we care about being a remote company. It's not just, it's, it's a little bit more for us than just, um, you know, happenstance. I think that meeting investors in person is different than, being domiciled in a place that investors live. So like no question, most investors live in San Francisco or New York. That that is that is true. However, and and also no question, even post COVID and post remote work, most fundraising is happening in San Francisco Bay Area, New York, Boston, LA, and the same markets where it happened prior to COVID. Um, that said, um, I don't, from my perspective, I think that people who are located in any area that um, you know works for them is probably going to be relevant. I mean, excuse me, it's probably going to be be sufficient for investors, but it doesn't hurt to still make connections with investors in person. Just like you know, any sort of connection uh, is is valuable in person on occasion. And so, my I think if you are say located in northern Maine for example, and that's where your company is, it, it probably wouldn't hurt to make a trip to New York and meet with fund investors in New York. It doesn't mean that you, um, it doesn't mean that you have to like domicile in that place, especially if you're hiring remote. I think if you're hiring in person in a geography that doesn't have a lot of tech talent or isn't related to what you're doing, if you're like somehow involved with pine trees and in Northern Maine, then that might make sense. But if you're saying, well, I'm trying to build a big in-person, you know, engineering team in the office in Northern Maine, that that would of course be odd because there's not a <laughs> lot of engineers there as far as, as far as I know. I'm from New England originally, so I have some knowledge of Maine, although I'm not from Maine. <laughs> um, and so so my sense is it's not a big engineering place. Um, so I think there's like there, but the short answer is I think remote is fine. However, doesn't hurt to meet investors in person, and most investors still live in uh, the locations they lived in previously. Yeah, I think you increase your chances of, you know, serendipitous encounters and just activity. You know, it's like in New York, I could literally 
I'm right outside of the city. I could hop on a ferry and I could find five startup events to go to tonight. I'm sure there's a, you know, a thing at Spotify's whatever office. I'm sure there's a talk at this and that. And that is a really, that's a huge advantage to be able to take, you know, advantage of, you know, on a whim. Now you could tra travel down for a week and book a bunch of things and get the same kind of value if you're outside of there and company specific. Like if you're trying to build a dating app and you're not anywhere near universities or you're not anywhere near where like people go out, like look at all the, you know, stories of the, the dating apps that were successful. It was like boots on the ground, you know, customer development and stuff like that. Very right. different. One of one of my favorite launch customers is Alaska's best shell, shellfish, who's literally in Alaska. <laughs> and the guy's got a business model that is leveraging like the way up north, um, you know, quality shellfish and like a kind of a franchise model where more people can run and operate them things. So like being in Alaska is great for him, but he still taps into the, you know, the ecosystem down in Seattle and through California when it's talking to investors, you know, gr growing the network and things like that. And when you say ferry, where is that from? Oh, I'm in Highlands, New Jersey. Okay, cool. I didn't know. So if you know Sandy Hook, yeah, it's, they put tons of work yeah. into it. It's amazing. Like, I'm, cool. I used to it's live. Sounds nice. Yeah, I used to live on the train line and it's long. better taking the boat than it is the train. I can imagine. Um, cool. Is there more? Yeah, yeah, we got another one. Uh, we get this question all the time. Uh, I, I actually have some resources in, to opine on this, but I, I'll let you go first. Um, how to value a startup pharma company? Now we're um, talking about valuations and maybe like putting it. together a funding round. Like, what goes well, into thinking of that? Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not an expert in this, so if you are, please, Ryan, share. Um, but if I was asked to do it, um, I would say that. For ultimately, you're going to have some sort of product that you're trying to bring to market. It's probably going to take multiple rounds and you would still do the same milestone based approach that I'm talking about where there's, you know, milestones of proving efficacy. There's milestones of proving out that you can manufacture at scale. And with each milestone there, you're going to look like other comparable things in your space and it would sort of work the same way. But I'll let you, Ryan, speak to any further expertise you have. I mean, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. And this expands to almost any industry. I know uh, Sama Shekhar also asked like, well, what about a, a hardware product? So every industry has the same principles. And usually the investors, especially angel investors and early stage uh, investors are, are well versed in those principles. So if you're a pharma company and you have to go through three years or four years of trials and FDA approval before you can see a cent of revenue, the investors who invest in that space are aware of that. So the trajectory of your company changes. You might not be doing revenue models when it comes to how many, you know, whatever, you know, solution you're doing, but like each milestone is another funding round where if you can meet, you know, the FDA requirements or if you can get whatever necessary license, that will likely come with an additional funding round. Now projections are still worth doing because eventually you need to monetize it and figure out, you know, and so total addressable market, people who have the condition, et cetera. Um, but the approach is similar. You just might change the orders of magnitude of the scalers in it, right? It might take you $10 million to get to revenue, you know, just because of the nature of the industry, but tap into investors who are aware of that. Same thing with hardware. People know like production runs, you know, are really expensive unless you're doing tens of thousands. You know, prototyping is an approach that you can take, but, you know, eventually you'll, you might be in a more capital intensive industry, but, you know, you should be able to change your model to show that and also work with the right kinds of investors you know, if somebody's looking at B2B enterprise SaaS, you know, super popular on both coasts and whatnot, they will probably lose interest in a autonomous, like great, you know, robot or something like that, because they just won't understand the economics. But there are people out there who are into that. And uh, for help, I'll throw it in the chat and uh, the follow up resources, valuations in general, we have a free tool, uh, we call the startup evaluation and feedback engine, which basically gathers a ton of information about both your team, your company, your market, it's kind of a branching path kind of thing. And it will get you roughly how much money you can probably raise and from what kinds of investors, um, as well as some resources to actually reach out to those. And then we do have a premium tool called a pre-money valuation report, which is similar, a little bit more straightforward. And that's more for you to help set a pre-money valuation in your own company. And that will actually take domicile, location, industry, uh, and different things into play to give you a rough range, You know, whether you're a, a $7 million company or more like a you know $500,000 company, depending on your stage. So those could be helpful resources for that because it is always a tough question we get. And everybody's situation is unique, but the principles are kind of the same. Makes sense. Oh, and I think I got the last question. Like, what are the main factors? Well, maybe we can spin into this a little bit. Uh, the main factors that affect the valuation for fintech startups. That might be a little bit more in your wheelhouse, Michael. Yeah, I think fintech, the, the unique part of fintech that I'd focus on is that there is some kind of capital intensity, typically, meaning there's some balance sheet or 
investment that you need to make to sell a unit of revenue, right? So to use Brex as an example, if someone uses our credit card, right, we are ultimately like they they pay their bill 30 days after the charge or some 15 days after, depending on, you know, when they charge. But there's some capital that's required from Brex to fund that. And that means that there's capital intensity. And so when you're looking at the unit economics, you want to make sure that you're accounting for that capital intensity and you're still making money, even accounting for the fact that you have to put some capital to work. There's lots of other examples of, of that in FinTech. For example, Brex has a bank account product, as I mentioned, and there, because it's regulated, there is some required regulatory uh, capital that we hold for our broker dealer. So that's another example. It's a smaller scale, but you just want to be thinking about those things um, because that capital intensity does affect the unit economics. Um, and then taking down that capital intensity and lowering the cost of funding over time is a big focus for investors. Not typically at the earliest seed stage, but getting towards A, B, they're going to be looking to see at least visibility into bringing that down over time. Yeah. And I think if you look at Brex's fundraising history versus, you know, uh, a B2B enterprise SaaS startup, I think it literally might be an order of magnitude bigger because of the capital requirements. I imagine in each funding round, it's like, oh, we like, we need this money to keep making this money. Um, so it's just a different, but that's not every, every business. You can still be a fintech business and not necessarily have those requirements or regulations. It all depends on your particular angle um, towards it. We, Gust is technically considered a fintech company, but we don't do transactions or payments or anything like that. So we're not regulated right. like a bank, but you know, we, we are more of a traditional SaaS approach where it's like, we charge for software, people pay for software. There's some stuff like we're a Delaware registered agent. We have to deal with regulations. You know, there's other things that we do, but it's not, you know, nearly uh, on the, the order of somebody who's kind of wrapping a bank and plus, plus, plus. Got it. Makes sense. Cool. Well, I think we got everything. Um, those are all the questions. We got some lovely praise in the chat. Michael, thank you yeah. very much for your time. No, thank you all. Really all fun. the questions. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I, please wrap it up. I was just saying, enjoyed it. And I appreciate everybody uh, joining and hopefully it was helpful. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, the the people are enjoying it, but uh, it was also a really nice, like high level breeze through of all that stuff. And I love how you, there's a, I say this about all of our partners that we like, there's often a spiritual alignment of like, you know, enough proactiveness, but not too much. You don't make, don't drive yourself crazy with every single possible thing, but just be sure like that financial stack is something that you're taking care of, or you're having somebody else take care of it. And you can check the results. We think the same thing with corporate back office, with fundraising rounds, with, you know, keeping your stuff reasonably on the rails so that if good things happen, you don't turn around and find out that you have to pay $300,000 to access $200,000 and oh no, now we're out of business, even though we thought this was a good thing. So totally. Be on the lookout for more stuff from us. Uh, the recording will go out uh, within a couple of days with some of the resources we mentioned, uh, and we will we'll do some more stuff. Keep uh, tuned in with the Gust Grow uh, founder curriculum. We'll have some more stuff. I think we have stuff for the next three weeks. I will be very busy. Um, thanks again. Thank you, Michael, for sharing your expertise. Thank have you. Have a great week, everybody. You too. Thanks so much. See you.